And we are your people, and we are assembled for you to come and stand in our midst, dazzle us with your presence, and give us hope for the future. For I see there are many amongst us that there's clouds looming in the distance with great thunders and lightnings and tornadoes, and they're headed our way in many cases. So we need you, Lord, and your confidence to ride out the storms and your confidence to be with you and your confidence in what you're doing in our hearts and in our minds and not only that, but what you're doing in our lives to establish not only yourself as king, but to conquer life that we might reign through you over our own lives, not over men, not over anything else, but we might assume that position that your Holy Spirit wants to endow us with to rule our own spirits. So come, open our ears to receive your word and install within us the magnificence of your presence, your grace, and you being alive. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Several years ago when I was... uh, very young and probably somewhat foolish although I find as I I get on older I really thought I was wise then (laughs) my brother and I we lived on the banks of the Willamette River one time and that's down in Eugene matter of fact we lived probably about six miles downstream from where the Mackenzie met the Willamette so the Willamette was quite full by the time it came past our house, because two rivers merging, coming out of the Cascades there. And my brother and I, being from Texas and uh, raised in the south in California, we thought water was to swim in. (laughs) We thought water was friendly. (laughs) You know, our little mud holes and our muddy rivers down there and our muddy ocean. and, And for us to see clear water was an absolute delight. However, we found when we were up in the Three Sisters Mountain area that the water was not friendly. If you got in it, you turned this blue shade of blue very quick. (laughs) What's wrong with the water? It's clear. It's so inviting. It's calling us. You know, we've got to get in it. (gasps) You get out quick. (laughs) You get in quick. And then you keep trying and keep trying. And finally, (gasps) but I don't understand. It's water, (laughs) you know. We... When I was in the eighth grade, played along the banks of the Willamette River in the summertime and got to the point that we would wade off into the shallows and then into the little deeper and then into the little deeper. We finally got to the point that we could cross the river and where we were crossing it, it was probably about three blocks across it. And, uh, you know, we'd watch for the right ripples and all that stuff because you could tell, oh, if it's rippling like that on the surface and running at speed, it's this deep. And you literally can tell that if you spend enough time on a river, how deep the river is, you know. Spots you wanted to look out for where it was just dead calm. You got a big hole there. <laughs> and if you got those whirly gig things in it, you know, you don't want to go there. Anyway, we got practiced up in, in our theology of floating down the river and uh, shot the rapids quite often. And we would get out shivering and blue and didn't care because we loved the water so much. But I can tell you that I learned not to swim against the current. I can tell you that we as people who belong to God, most of our lives try to swim against the current. Instead of, where are you taking me, Lord? What do you do with the scripture? It says, rejoice in all things. Well, I happen to be going through some personal gravity problems that are crushing me. Rejoice in all things. How do you rejoice in it? You rejoice in it by being and knowing that Jesus himself, that you're going to walk with him through that whatever it is in those dismal days of darkness. How many of you have gone through dismal days of darkness? Uh, how many are in dismal days of darkness? <laughs> how many of you are not going to raise your hand? <laughs> have you been freed from some dismal days of darkness? How many of you see some clouds off in the future? It looks like dismal days of darkness might visit again. I'm telling you, it's cyclical. Just like if you lived in Texas, you could expect thunderstorms and tornadoes every year at certain times. 
our lives has uncertain times like that also. And part of the problem in our thinking is our thinking. We're supposed to be putting on the mind of Christ. I have some scripture I want to read you, maybe a couple of scripture readings, and then we'll get back into maybe our thought process. I'm going to start off in Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, you do realize there were seven chapters for him to say, therefore. (laughs) <laughs> seven chapters of instruction before he can say, therefore. And the problem is, we say there's no condemnation in Christ for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I used to work in an oil field, and I had a lot of friends, and they'd all go bar hopping and doing the things that night people do and all that stuff. Some of them called themselves Christians, and I would question them. I said, so, where were you in last night? Are you in the bar? Are you in somebody's bedroom? Were you in drinking? Were you in yourself? Were you in your party? Because if you're in any of those things, guess who you're not in? Not in Christ Jesus. Right? Not not in Christ Jesus, standing in the bar, drinking and talking about all the weird stuff that goes on in darkness. You're not in Christ Jesus if you're in there. So Paul has outlined for us seven chapters of what it's like to be in Christ and what it's going to take to get us in Christ. And in chapter 7, he says something really interesting. There's this illustration of marriage that he gives. He says, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over men only as long as he lives? I'd like you to take note of that. The law has authority over us to condemn us if we live our life the way we want to. Uh, you, get, you getting that? It has authority over us still if we live our lives the way we want to. For an example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries a mother man while her husband is still alive, she is an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she has released from that law and is not an adulteress even though she marries another man so what's his illustration that he's giving here you know are you get are you getting this he's he's talking he's fixing to talk about the bride of christ he's fixing to talk about that woman as long as she's married to something so the people that are doing all the bad things sleeping around doing all the bad things are married to something and he's saying something's going to have to die in this And he goes on to say, So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. How do we die to the condemnation? By having Christ live in us. And if Christ lives in us, it's supposed to be his body. And his body is busy about his father's business, not about his own business. Now, we've got some cog works we want to take a look at here for a moment i uh, think if we're ready i just sprung that on the guys there a second ago we'll see how quick they can respond they're sweating bullets back there oh no <laughs> <laughs> we have to consider our thinking and how our mind works it has all these cog wheels in it of issues of things of answers of purposes of things it wants to accomplish And let's go on to our next slide there and see what we get. As you can see, our problems in our brain, the way we think, can get quite complicated. Beyond our capacity, this wheel is turning that way, that wheel is turning this away. I think I should do this. I think I shouldn't do this. And we've got all these intersecting gears that run other gears. And can we get, do we have any more there? Ah, now that's a very special gear, isn't it? It's got one gear on the outside surrounding all the rest of the gears, and then all the little gears are responding to that outside gear, which is making the inside gear turn. Or is it the inside gear that's on a shaft that is the actual gear making all the little gears turn to make a wheel turn? Do you see... Sometimes we can't figure out the problem because we don't know which way it's supposed to be running and which way it's supposed to be engaged. Can we go on? Do we have another? 
<laughs> now wrap your mind around this, if you would. <laughs> this is you actively thinking. It has no external input, only internal thinking. And if it has internal thinking only, it has no external purpose. It's only sitting there going in a loop and in a circle of thinking its own, in its own capacity. Now that thinking can be about the world, it can be about our desires, it can be about what we want to do, it can be about religion. But when there's an external gear that's supposed to be, do, you, do we have one, just an external gear driving others? <clears throat> when it, this is us by ourselves, and I'm, I'm hoping that we found something. I gave them an assignment and they weren't sure what it was back there, but they're working on it, see? <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to think about this. Uh, in our relationship, uh, I'm the master cog in the family. Is that right? right? And then Jackie, if she wants to be my wife, a wife makes a decision, hey, I want to engage with that cog and I'm going to turn with that cog. Right? So she comes and takes her cog and says... I want to implement it into this cog of you. I will not spin my own way. I will not disengage. And whichever direction you spin, I will do the same. Now, don't you know in her life, she has all sorts of little cogs already hooked up to her life, right? And so all those cogs, if they engage in marriage to me, all those cogs are supposed to do what? If I turn this away, they all turn the same way, right? Now, suppose she wants to turn another way, or doesn't, um, how about if she just questions? Now, if you're going to question something, you've got to disengage to look at it. Now, all the other cogs cease. And what if that cog separates itself and says, oh, I'm with you, I'm still with you, but... Uh, I think things should be done this way, and it starts turning its own way, and it's still next to. This is not a husband and wife thing. I'm fixing to sneak up on you and embarrass you. <clears throat> if that cog, and I think we've got some more cogs. The guys have been on it. <laughs> now, I tell you, our, our, thinking, our thinking is complicated. And what we need is an external force that external force that we are supposed to engage with is God. If we do not, did you find me a single gear with a bunch of gears running off of it? They're still looking for that one. This one was cool. I, I want you to understand God's Word, His Spirit, empower the gear and engages with the gear of us if we have the Spirit of Jesus within us. We cannot get the Spirit of Jesus in us and play unless we receive the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus will save us. The Spirit of Jesus will fulfill its promises that it will pardon our sin and wash away our sin. But we must have the energizing gear of the Spirit of God in us for the gears to mesh. Now, I want to read you some things, and you're going to get pretty condemned and pretty uncomfortable. So, in Romans chapter 8, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the sinful nature desires. Now, who's this book to? It's to the world, right? It's to the sinners, right? No, this book was written to a church, to people who are already filled with the Spirit, walk with God, were doing things Jesus' way, and they were having some hiccups along the way. You ever get the hiccups and, <gasps> well, what was that? You know, that, that really doesn't bother you very much unless you're in the middle of a sermon and <laughs> you can't do the sermon, unless you're drinking, drinking a cup of hot, scalding coffee, <laughs> you know, I, these hiccups that we have do some damaging to us spiritually and in our relationships with others. And those hiccups have to do with our sinful nature. 
Now, we have this excusatology theology that comes in and, excuse me, it's okay for me to sin. Well, I got news for you. Excuse you, it's not okay for you to sin if you want to belong to Christ, if you want to go to heaven. There's all these passages of Scripture in the New Testament that's written to the church that those who do such things have no inheritance, and it ought to frighten you to death. It constantly frightens me to death. That those who do such things, it lists immorality, it lists witchcraft, it lists going off and playing with your friends and doing your own thing, it lists selfishness, and it lists all these brain-dead things that we do as a sinful person. It says, if you want to be that, you will have nothing in Christ. Now, I remind you, the children of Israel living in the promised land, they had received their inheritance, and they were standing in it, living in it. So the inheritance that we're talking about is not the inheritance of us going into heaven. The inheritance that is available is for us to walk and live and move and breathe and have our nature, our purpose, our minds, everything that there is locked into the kingdom of God now. Energized now. Now is the only time you have to be a cog and do things God's way. Now is the only time that you can engage as his wife with him on his terms. And if he decides to spend one way, you spend. If he decides to go another way, you spend whatever way. As a matter of fact, if you've got other purposes, that's where the gear, ah, I've got to disengage because I've got other purposes. I've got other appointments. I've got, I got all these things down here with all these other cogs. These things are important to me. Now that has to do with our desires and our purposes. We are supposed to engage. When Jackie engaged with me, she was engaged for life. That's what an engagement is supposed to be about. I want to engage. How do I mesh with you? Let's clutch things, slow things down, and then let's put things together so that they will spin forever the same direction. In doing so, she had to find out, is this a man of God? And then she had to find out, do I want to engage? Because if I want to engage, he's supposed to be engaged with God. And whatever God spends him, I've got to keep up with that. Now, again, this is not about husbands and wives. It's about our personal engagement with our Lord Jesus Christ. He has a certain way that he wants us to act, look, dress, think, speak, breathe. Everything we do, it must be hand-tailored to be like him. And if he's in us, then we're going to look like him, smell like him, think like him, and the Holy Spirit's training us in all those objectivities to be like Jesus Christ. If you want to keep your identity, and there's the problem, in our desires, we're looking for our identity. You know, I can tell you, back when I was younger, I put on a pair of cowboy boots. I hated wearing boots. I put on a cowboy hat. I thought, well, okay, this will look cool, in a cowboy dress, and it was quite expensive and all that stuff, and wore it around for a while, and I'd look in the mirror, and I'd think, man, that's just not you. I was looking, who are you? Who are you? Who do you want to be? You know, and sometimes we look at our friends and, well, okay, we'll be like them because that's the way all the friends are. No, the only friend we're supposed to have is Jesus Christ. If Jesus lives within us and we choose other friends, we are a betrayer of him. He must be our friend above everything else that there is. He must be our recreation. And I can tell you, if uh, uh, any, any of you know me, I'm, I've had a very adventurous life. And I can say, above most men, uh, most other men that I have met, I've had the greatest adventure. But that adventure was strictly because God chose to give me that adventure because I live with him. And he said, ah, we're going to Alaska, son. Make this phone call. I said, uh, you just make a phone call and you go to Alaska. And you, That's right. You know, I want you to call this company, and they're going to hire you on the spot, and I want you on a jet tomorrow to go to Alaska to go to work. I, you can do that, Lord. And you know how hard it is to go to work in Alaska in the oil field? Mm -hmm. This is back years ago when I was young, very young. I made the phone call, and sure enough, I'm off to Alaska. And sure enough, I'm seeing things, and sure enough, I'm on adventure, and sure enough, God is with me and sending me here and there and doing all kinds of things. So you cannot expect a dull life if you're going to walk with Jesus Christ. What you can expect is a new identity, and it is not yours. He does not look like the world. He does not dress like the world. He didn't then. He didn't dress like the world. He didn't act like the world. And the reason I keep saying that is because I want you to know you're supposed to be looking in the mirror and say, is that what Jesus would look like? Because it didn't matter what people think of us. It matters what he thinks about us. 
It doesn't matter what, if I think I'm Mr. Cool, it matters what he thinks. And what does his father think? Because his father and him are the ones that make judgments of whether I'm going to get my daily allotment to live in his kingdom in the revelatory process of knowing Jesus. Knowing him only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our yielding to him only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot even yield or engage in the gear of Jesus Christ without the Spirit. I'll read you some subjective things here you can think about. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. And I can't tell you how many sessions I've been in, but I like this and I want this and I desire this and God, surely he wants this for me. And all they're talking about is desires, desires, desires. It says, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires. We must identify, my nature wants what it wants. It doesn't want what God wants. We got another cog? Did y'all find one? Okay, we have two heads shaking. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Ah, engine. And we have a transmission back here. We got some ringing going on in the microphone there. As you can see, the energy of God that's being released is through us bringing in the Spirit, that's the air from heaven, and His processes and His purposes. It ignites and it turns through the shaft and goes all the way into the gears to run the transmission, which makes everything in our life go. Everything has to be powered by the Spirit. If it's not powered by the Spirit, it will not go. If it's powered by our own flesh, it has no engine, and it just sits there. Do you remember the gears that were all in a circle doing nothing? <coughs> this one's got a shaft that goes out that does something. It goes to the wheels. It makes the car go. If your car, your spiritual car, is not going into God's presence, that you have a problem. And I want to address that problem, and we're going to address some rough issues in the midst of this, and then we're going to get on with uh, that. Now, there, there, there's a... Cog that's energized with another cog. Did you all see the other one down below? We cannot perform and do anything for God or in God unless it's in and by the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit only. Now, if we can kill the lights, and we'll get back to this. Unless you got another one? You got another one up? No, that's it. We're done? Okay. So those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live according... With the Holy Spirit, have their minds set on what the Holy Spirit desires. Are you seeking what the Holy Spirit desires? See, he desires just like he went into the grave and he, in his power, resurrected Jesus Christ out of that grave. Did You, you realize it was him who did that, right? Jesus and, went, and also the Holy Spirit's the one that birthed Jesus. Did you, you knew that one too? Oh, y'all are real Bible scholars. <laughs> Let's go on here. That the mind of the sinful man is death, or the mind that wants its own desires and its own purposes, its own actions for its own functionality, for its own joy, for its own purposes. That's called the sinful mind. It says the mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Holy Spirit is life and peace. It is life. It's state. It's stating there is this new reality of functionality with God that brings a physical life out of the spiritual into the natural realm that we live in, so it becomes supernatural, that God himself becomes real to us here. And if we're intersecting with the real God, can he manipulate those things that are around us? When Jesus was here on earth, did he not manipulate the things here on earth? He was a spiritual man connected to Father. From the Father, he had the spiritual direction and understanding to take that which his Father gave him and use that. When he took what the Father was giving him, he had words of knowledge. When he took what the Father was giving him, he had power to heal. When he took what the Father was giving him, he knew where to go, when to go, who to pick as his disciples. Everything in his life was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit and bringing all the accusations from heaven to him so he could responsibly use that acquisition for his Father's purposes here in life. Now, you would might be a little bit embarrassed if I asked you, would you paint for me your gear connected with God and how many things you're doing for Him? 
Would you show me your gear that's intersecting him and how many things you're doing for him? Because if a wife is supposed to be cogged up with the husband and do his purposes, and she's not doing those purposes, is she a wife? That's not a definition of a wife. Definition of a wife, God said, here's your helpmate. One is going to engage with you and accomplishes the purposes that I gave you to accomplish. The wife that disengages, and I've got all my own wheels spinning down here, my own purposes. Those purposes are not her husband's purposes, and I question that she's a wife. Not according to God's term, would be according to Satan's terms would be according to the world's terms. You can be anything if you're a wife. You can be a wife of a wife. Or a husband of a wife. Or, I don't know, it's all messed up. You might notice that too. There's some weird stuff going on. But I tell you, there's just as weird stuff in our heart. We are supposed to be engaged with God, and His purpose is supposed to be our life, and no other purpose. It goes on. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Ah, I missed something there, didn't I? The mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind of controlled by the Holy Spirit is life and peace. And the sinful mind is hostile to God. The mind that has its own desires, its own pursuits, its own will, it's hostile to God. Do you not know that? It's hostile to Him. And if it's hostile to Him, if you've got something you need here, are you going to get that from Him? I, mean, I can tell you, i got little grandkids visiting. If they're hostile to me, they don't get nothing. Right? You feel the same way? You did that with your kids. If they were hostile to you, they got nothing. Fine. You want, you want to be hostile? You get nothing. You want to be resistant? See that gear? The child's supposed to be engaged to the parent, and it, 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 it wants to turn the other way, and it's trying to slow the gear down. No, I'm not. No, but, 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 but. It's, it's, it's struggling. It's slowing the master gear down and all the rest of the gears are not functioning because one of the gears in there wants to give an alternate plan or alternate purpose or alternate desire or, or something that they want and it begins to resist the mother. You know, you got a little eight-year-old that's a really good resistor. <laughs> I mean, she, she, if I wrote her name on her, it'd be resistor, but I love her. <laughs> And I'm telling you, she's made a master gear that don't yield. A master gear will go ahead and turn that little gear the way it needs to go. It needs to learn to go with the big gear. And that's been being accomplished, and there's been such changes in her heart. Instead of being a child that wants to manipulate and control, you realize a wheel that wants to do its own thing is one that wants to manipulate and control. And what's that? Pharmacia. And what's pharmacia? Come on. Anybody remember? Pharmacia is witchcraft. Control is witchcraft. I want to control the outcome. I want to control this. I want to control this. You might, I've said this a thousand times, and I may have to demonstrate to you. We may have to go out and find one of those big wash pots and get it set up down here and build a fire in it and order a few lizard tongues and bat wings and begin to say a few incantations and throw those in there and speak those. And I want my will. This has got to be done. That's what God says your purposes and your will are to him. They're witchcraft. We're, we're trying to control the outcome of something. If we're doing it through our passions, our desires, we're not yielding the body that Jesus Christ, if we've invited him in, what is he just sitting in there for watching you turn your cog the way you want to? I told you, we're headed for some rough water. So if the waves are coming up over your deck, let's get on into some scripture here. Those controlled, in verse 8, by the sinful nature cannot please God. Now, Romans, Paul is speaking to some Christians. And he reminds you, he reminds them, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Holy Spirit. If... The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. Do you realize there's two different things there? I see people that have trouble with their theology all the time. This should iron out that trouble. It, says, it talked about us being filled with the Spirit of Christ. Let's read it. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, you realize the word's talking about the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit of God. The two different entities that live in you. 
Now, I have many people, does that mean I'm not saved? I don't have the Holy Spirit? That's not what it says. You're saved if you have the Spirit of Christ. i got a whole bunch of my brothers in the evangelical world that are Baptist, that I came from that bloodline, and I can tell you our bloodline, if they believe in Jesus Christ and Christ was within them, then they are saved because it says whoever has the Spirit of Christ in them is saved. But that's got nothing to do with meshing with God and changing our lifestyle and having a purpose for Him and in Him. It just means we got saved. Well, you got saved. What are you going to do with the saved part? Go ahead and live your life and your purposes and in your desires. Now you're going to have to explain in the end, well, see, I had the little embryo of Jesus Christ, but I had a great life and did my own thing, but I'm saved. And Jesus is going to say, stand there and look at you and say, you were a worker of iniquity. You know what that means? It means you were lawless. You didn't keep my instructions. A worker of iniquity means that you threw off his instructions. He said, and then what's his next statement? I don't know you. Go away from me. You were a worker of lawlessness. You didn't work for me. You were not a part of my cog. You didn't engage with me. You didn't look like me. You didn't act like me. You didn't smell like me. None of your purposes were my father's purposes. None of your purposes were my purposes. Yes, you attended church. Yes, my spirit was within you to pay for your debt, but you never did anything in God. Why didn't you engage and make his purposes your purposes? You realize these conversations are coming. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm being light-footed on this. Because you're going to be standing for the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the God of gods. And he's going to examine you on these questions. And your philosophy is not going to hold up. You cannot show up riding on a broom practicing witchcraft and give him some excuse for not looking like him. You cannot expect to enter the gate if you don't look like him, if you don't act like him, if you don't do the things he said do. You cannot expect these things from him. And reasonably so, how can you expect to call upon all the blessings of God that we so desperately need when there's clouds of darkness, when there's things looming over us? How can we expect Him to answer? There's the problem. We think we have a right to resolve the problem using Him as our puppet to accomplish what we want done in our own purposes and our own desires. And He said, I don't think so. I'm not up to bat for that. However, if you want to do things my way, if you want to get filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to follow what the Spirit has to say, if you want to stop being a cog that wants to turn the other way, and you get engaged with my purposes, now, if you get engaged with His purposes, comes all the stuff from heaven that we need, all the stuff that Jesus used while He was on the face of the earth to bring blessings to people, to bring freedom to people. There's only two kingdoms. One is called the kingdom of darkness, and we are supposed to be delivered from that. And we like our darkness. Our darkness, in there we hide our purposes. Our darkness, in there we get to talk with our friend, the enemy, that tells us that we can keep our purposes, that tells us we can keep our identity, that tells us we can be Mr. or Mrs. Cool, that tells us that we can do things and get comfortable in life, that makes us an absolute bore to God where we get to the end, we have not accomplished anything for Him. God gave you breath and life, and you're supposed to live it for Him to the day you die. And then you're going to give an account for all the time, just like on a punch clock, and He's going to say, wait a minute, I, I see, yeah, you went, you know, what is that, several hundred hours to church, and you did that for me and that for me. Do you realize how many hours there are in the 70 years that he gives you? And how many hours we use? We watch TV more than we do anything for God. We sleep more than we do anything. We brush our teeth more than we pray. Did you know that? If you add up the number of hours you brush your teeth over the course of your life, for the average Christian, it outweighs six to one the amount of time that people spend in prayer. Now, I'm beating us up pretty good. So if you feel totally bloody by now, <clears throat> let's get on in the scripture. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Do you catch that? 
I hope that fixes your theology permanent so you're not going back and forth about those people that don't and are not filled with the power of the Spirit. It says if they have the Spirit of Christ in them, they are saved. However, that doesn't mean that they're engaged, nor does it mean that they're fully empowered. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit, this is your mind, your thoughts and actions, are alive. Who are they alive in? They're supposed to be connected to Christ in you, right? Not alive in the world, not alive in our own desires, our own purposes. We're supposed to be alive in Christ who is now in you. Because of righteousness, your, your, your spirit becomes alive because of his righteousness that's within you. And if the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of him who raised Jesus from the dead, see, it specifies the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. It says if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, and he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Holy Spirit. I lost you in the midst of that. There's a lot there in that little cog circle. What it's saying is Jesus Christ was put in you. If you engage your life in him, if I engage my life in him, he's the master cog of all my purposes. Now I can receive the Holy Spirit because I'm engaged with Christ. I'm not a resistor to what he said. I'm not a resistor to his instructions. He gave us many instructions in the scripture. I engage with him, now the Holy Spirit, I invite him in. And now I'm cogged in with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And now power begins to come to change my mind and my heart. And that's my biggest problem. I cannot change my mind. I cannot change my desires. I cannot change my heart on my own. I do not have that capacity I've tried to be good. I've tried to not do those things. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. The only way that those things can change is that my purposes change and my desires change. So I learned a long time ago to begin to pray, Oh, God, my desire is wrong. I don't look like you when I look in the mirror. I don't act like you. Most people, you know, are, are real friendly and really want to give you a piece of their mind. And, and God's trying to give us a piece of his mind, the right piece. And he's trying to say, will you put that your piece of your mind to death? Because I can tell you, religious folks are the ones that have the greatest problem because when, once we receive the Spirit, now there's many of us who want to keep our precepts that we're something and we want to control and we use Scripture to still try to control the situation. We use prophecy. I've, I've, seen, I've seen prophetic wars. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is pathetic wars. It's supposed to bring the peace of God, the purpose of God, and God's presence right into our midst. Prophecy is supposed to edify and build up, not destroy and tear down. So at any given stage of our spirituality, we can again become a separate cog and use religious works to establish ourselves as being one in control to make ourselves dominant over all those who are around us and everything that everyone has to say. Now, is there a way out of this dismal circle? Yes, there is. We will get to that, but we're going to have to float down the river for a while longer, and we're into rapids. As the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, and you've raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who live in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. 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 The reason I'm saying that four times is because in my Baptist circles, we said, oh, Jesus has freed me. I have no obligations. Once saved, always saved. I got nothing to do. Jesus did it all. I'm, tar I'm sorry, but Scripture says, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation. But it is not to our own purposes. It is not to our own activities. It is not to our own desires. It is to live, excuse me, it is not a, to the sinful nature. Let me back up. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but not to the sinful nature, not to live according to it. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will surely die. 
But if the Spirit, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, how do we put to death the misdeeds of the body? Through the Holy Spirit. If they were just washed away and I didn't have to deal with them, I wouldn't have to put away the misdeeds of the body, would I? Come on, think with me here. Because I, I want you to get your theology right. Because in our theology, it's important. Our theology means what we think about God, and better yet, that we take on His thinking. And in His theology, He's making the statement that you're supposed to put to death the misdeeds of the body. You are. Is that a directive, even though I've received Jesus, even though I have the blood of Christ? Is that a directive of the Spirit that I'm still supposed to put to death, put to death my misdeeds? I'm not supposed to lie anymore. I'm not supposed to cheat. I'm not supposed to steal. I'm not supposed to be arrogant. I'm not supposed to be rude. I'm not supposed to be angry. I'm not supposed to fight. I'm supposed to be gentle and kind and loving. And all those are exactly opposite of the sinful nature. And the scripture says, now, why do you have fights and quarrels amongst you? Because you want and you don't get. <laughs> he puts it in pretty simple terms, does he not? In the book of James. He says, it's simply because you want something and you don't get it. Well, I got a little eight-year-old. We've got a lot of tussles because she wanted something. And I promise you, she didn't get it. And she's getting it now that you cannot do that. That is not permissible for you to do that. You're going to engage in the cog of this family and do things this way. And now she's starting to understand that. And now peace and joy is turning in for her life for the first time. For the first time in this child's life, she's not in control. And as a result... She's coming to life. She's gleeful. She's joyful. She's bouncing. She's this, this happy, beautiful little spirit in the midst because she's required to look like, act like, dress like, smell like what Jesus does, right? Because if I'm engaged in that cog, and Jackie's engaged in this cog, then that cog and this cog are engaged with those cogs. If we're going to look like, smell like, and act like, then they're going to look like, smell like, and act like, Right? In the midst of that, she's finding life for the first time instead of get out of my way and do things my way. Now, I want to get on in Scripture because i got some more to give you. Here's the result if we're willing to put to get to death, if we're willing to come into agreement, Lord, man, I shouldn't have said that yesterday. Oh, God. Well, if you want to put that misdeed to death, then you're supposed to not only confess it before God, but if we've sinned against each other, we're supposed to confess it to each other and say, oh, brother, sister, please, please forgive me. I, I know you were wrong, but I know you were mad, and I, and I just want you to forgive me. Is that the way to ask forgiveness? <laughs> oh, we shouldn't be this way. We should be Christians, therefore. I forgive you. Is that forgiveness? I know all of us are sinners, and therefore I forgive you. Have I, have I asked for forgiveness? Until we identify us and us alone, that God is not happy with what we've done, we have missed the mark. We have missed the mark. God wants you to recognize. And how can you recognize if you're not walking in the Spirit? Because the Spirit is the only one that can show us the evil side about us, right? Matter of fact, if you read in Romans chapter 7, that's the whole crux of him talking. He's saying the whole purpose of the law, it was spiritual. All it did was prove we are not spiritual. It showed us plainly that we stunk and smelt like dead sin, and he said it was spiritual. But now if we marry Christ, we come into Christ, Christ died to the law, did he not? So if I'm in Christ and I'm no longer under the law, but if I want life, I have to enter the law of the Spirit. There's two different things going on here. One, Jesus doing away with the, con the condemning death part of what the law requires because of me being a resistor. God spoke, made the world, and he said anybody who wants to turn it the wrong way dies. That's pretty, that's a, why? Because everybody else would die if they want to turn it the wrong way. That's the purpose. Man came and he wants to turn, spin the world the wrong way. 
Everybody stops breathing because our oxygen goes out into outer space without the rotational activity of the earth. Our gravity ceases because without the rotational activity of the earth. There's many things that ceases without our planet moving. So God has his planet earth going his way and he wants us to join in with the way it turns. Now, he says that the mindset of him was one to show us you're dead. Jesus came and said, I pay the penalty. If they're in me, they're not dead. Now, if you're in the bar, what are you? Are you alive in him or are you dead? If I come out and I say, Lord, forgive me. Oh, God, I do not want to go there. I will not. In Jesus' name, help me. Oh, oh. Now you've got to pursue the Spirit because the Spirit is the one that can give you the power to overcome going there. But if you continue to go there, Jesus makes the statement in the New Testament, there is no more inheritance for those who do such things. And again, I'm hoping it makes you real nervous because I don't want you to lose the inheritance that you live in. There's an inheritance that you can live in today and it's called his presence. Let's go on. He says, those who, those, but you, you put to death the misdeeds of the body. If you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live because of those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Ah, all of a sudden we go from those who live in the Spirit, they become the sons of God. It says that they are the sons of God, but I want you to know all that does is line you up for adoption. For you did not receive a spirit to make you slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Daddy. Oh, Daddy, I need you. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, you know that. When you first started this and you were living in the planet darkness and you could hear from planet light, God saying, Hello, are you in there? Hello. Come out. <laughs> I'm over here. I'm real. He was speaking into your darkness and he was trying to get you to come into the land of the light. It's in his son. Now, part of the problem is we split the difference. Okay, here's darkness and here's light. Okay, I got my big toe over the line. <laughs> I'm safe. When Jesus comes, he might let your big toe in, but the rest of you is not coming. <clears throat> There's going to be an amputee. And that big toe is not going to be able to walk on its own without the rest of the members of the body, is it? So we need to stop skirting the issue. And we've got to make a decision and realize there's a real kingdom of darkness. We were formed and a part of that. And we have to come out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. Where we do and say things right. We no longer use hostility. We no longer use anger. We no longer try to control. We no longer shake our fists. We no longer are violent. We no longer. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ, if He's in control, He's not that way, is He? He's not brutal. He's not brutish. He doesn't sulk. The Spirit of Christ is full of love, full of peace, full of joy, full of the actions of God, full of all the positive things that I need for my brain to engage with God and to work right. And I desperately need my brain to work right. If your brain's not working right, the enemy is going to take it into self-solitude darkness. You know what self-solitude darkness is? I've done many counseling over the last 30-something years. And those who are really in trouble... Turn inward and more inward and more windward. And talk more about God, become, become more separated and more separate. We're not separated unto themselves, neither is separated unto God. The enemy is speaking to them, getting them to pull tighter and tighter in. Well, that's more about me, myself, and I, and I've got to protect myself, and I've got to protect my, my, all, and my, and I've got to, I've got to, my comfort, and my, 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 I've met many people that I helped them out of institutions because they wanted to be closed in with themselves. I'm telling you, there is no being closed in with yourselves. In this kingdom of darkness, the enemy will speak to you, and he will take you down further and further and further until finally he convinces you you are no good. He's the one that says you're no good, and Jesus says, come and let me live in you, and something will be good in there. 
Then Jesus comes and lives with you, and he says, hey, you're not living up to what he said, and therefore you're no good, right? <laughs> I just look into Jesus, and, and, and when I hear that, and I said, there was never anything good with me. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your righteousness. And I start turning to the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the key. Getting out of this dismal cage. It's crying out to the Lord. It's realizing that the things that he wants us to experience are available right now. And not being fooled by Satan of him. How many years has he promised you something? The enemy. And how many times has he come through with it? He always leaves you in the dumper and always leaves you in this dismal mess that you have to pay for everything that got broke and all the damages. You have to pay or go without because of the way he talked you into doing things. When are we going to start doing it? Just simply the way Jesus says do it. And if we do it, then life will come. Peace will come. If we do it, the depression will leave. If the do it, if we do it, we'll be freed from the rages. Do you realize if we want to control something and we can't, we go into rages and we just can't stand it and we'll be, oh man, this has got to happen. And, and I've, I've had people jump up, and, oh, I just got to prophesy this. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, whoa, flesh man, flesh man alert. Our God is calling us to be people of peace, but we can't be that without the Spirit. I would submit to you and want to read to you who is wise and understanding. I, I meet many people that pray, okay, I need wisdom. You know, some people are praying that they might be able to win at the stock market game. You know, that roulette wheel. Which stock do I pick? I'm praying for wisdom. That's not wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. Ah. Let him show it by his good life. By deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and self-ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. We're in the church, and as we move closer to Christ, we're going to learn spiritual things, we're going to acquire spiritual gifts. The determining factor of whether those are usable in our midst is what's the purpose is it God's purposes or is it part of our selfish ambition still looking for that identity? I can tell you some of the church that believes in prophecy and has taken a whole left turn and there's been whole destructions of churches as a result of selfish ambition using spiritual gifts for self-glory. Jesus sat down his five-fold ministry. He set down a shepherd. But yet, when I look at Christianity, most of Christianity is the me, myself, I. I'm on a hill. I know. I figured it out. I know what the Bible says. I know theology. Well, okay, then who's your shepherd? Oh, I don't need one of those. Well, if you don't need a shepherd, you're a goat. The Scripture says the sheep are scattered without a shepherd. And if you don't have a shepherd, your whole life spiritually is going to be scattered and you're not going to be able to walk with God. Let's go on here. He's got some things to say to us. It says, where you have envy and self-ambition, there you'll find disorder and every evil practice. But now let's examine what wisdom looks like that comes from God. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. It doesn't have any motive to control anybody. It doesn't have any motive to look good spiritually at church. It doesn't have any motive for controlling the outcome of the service. service. I've been in services, not in my church, but in other churches, where there was this competition between people who wanted to prophesy as whose prophecy turned the, the wheel the way it was supposed to go. They thought it even superseded what the pastor had to say. Even though they may have been listening for five minutes, but the pastor may have listened for 60 hours. Now, I'm bringing it into a realm, and if you've been around the block and visited other churches, you've seen that take place. 
But there's also selfish ambition in our lives. There's selfish ambition in my purposes about how I can get ahead. If you're always hitting the thought or the thoughts coming to you, this is how you can get ahead. That's the enemy's voice. And you've got to learn to recognize the enemy's voice. We have to shut down the enemy's voice, and we can't shut down the enemy's voice unless we can recognize his voice. To overcome the mind and to let the Spirit rule in our lives, we have to listen to what the Spirit has to say. And He has, he has so much to say that if you listen 24-7, you could not absorb all that He has to say. But there again, our little time clock, it's nickel and dimes of what He has to say and actually listening to it. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Pure in the sense it purely wants to accomplish God's will, God's way. Simple terms. It wants to accomplish God's will, God's way. It does not want to accomplish your will. It does not want to accomplish my will. It wants to accomplish God's purposes and his prime directives. If it's outside the bounds of that, it's not pure, is it? Then it's mixed motives. If there's mixed motives, there's always some, something in there attached to that, emotion or something attached to that from the kingdom of darkness. So if we're going to pray for wisdom, we have to pray, Oh God, show me your will. Didn't Jesus, and that basically his only prayer that he prayed while he was here on the earth? Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. He was always praying for the Father's will. And when, even when he went to teach his disciples how to pray, it was about the Father's will. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And he expanded that will, that it was your kingdom come now, your will be done now. Now there's a prayer that begins in purity, and if we're in that mindset, we'll be receiving things that can establish his kingdom. The second thing that takes place, it's peace-loving. difference between peace and peace-loving. Peace is a cessation, not a cessation of events, but it's God orchestrating. Peace loving means I'm loving everyone around me regardless of their capability or incapability and I'm willing to be orchestrated by him. I'm willing to be orchestrated, not try to get him to be orchestrated. I'm talking about somebody else. You know, we're always worried about, well, that person's not, and that person is lacking and that person, we're all lacking something. That's why God said we need to come together because I'm telling you, if you just only have one leg, you're just going to be able to hop. But if we can get both legs together, even if they got athlete's foot, we can still walk. <laughs> even if they're scratching and itching, we can still walk. Even if you've got a knee that's kind of bum and lame and it, doesn't, it, it, it creaks when it goes, we can still walk. So instead of focusing on each other's problems and, well, that person's not mature and this person's not mature, we're supposed to be looking and at ourselves only and how I can dominate this person and make this person do what God's will is. Many people think God's will is I'm supposed to tell you what God's will is. Now, that's a, that's a pastor, pastoral, one of the five-fold ministries is supposed to tell you what God's will is. You're not supposed to tell each other what God's will is. Well, God's will for you is this, and here's a word from God that this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. How is that edifying? Scripture says prophecy is supposed to be edifying and build up the person. I didn't build up anybody. So when you come together, if you're listening and you're praying for wisdom, in that, oh, just give me a word for this person. Oh, God, I know what's right for them. <laughs> you're not asking for a word. You're asking for a flag of, go get them, stick them, take them by the throat. <laughs> get them straightened out. If we're praying for wisdom from heaven, it's first of all pure, then peace-loving, and it's considerate. Jesus came as a man, and he is filled with compassion, knowing of our weaknesses, knowing that we can't make it on our own, knowing that we're going to trip and fall on our bottom lip, knowing our nose is going to be flat from being on our face, and that's not in prayer. <laughs> you know, that, that's us just doing stupid things. Now, he knows that. Until we can learn how to keep our balance and walking in the Spirit, and how that occurs is us coming in and putting our cog in with the Holy Spirit and saying, yes, lead me, Holy Spirit. I'll do things your way. No longer my way, your way. Now, if you're having difficulty getting there, I've got a remedy for you. Before I do that, let me give you this. If we're praying for the wisdom, it must be pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive. 
So if there's missed motives of controlling the outcome of some something or someone, or somebody wants to hold up the magic envelope, remember Johnny Cat or Johnny, uh, what was his name, Johnny? Carson. Pardon? Carson. Johnny. Yeah, he'd hold that up, the great Karnak, and ah, oh, and here's the answer. You know, there's all kinds of stuff like that going on, and that's to show superiority spiritually to others. And in that, it's a misuse of a spiritual gift. If we're hearing wisdom from above, it's talking about being submissive. That means us becoming a cog and us meshing as a body. Because the head can't come unless the body is formed. And if the body is not submissive, it won't come together. And if the body doesn't come together, the head's not coming. And we need the head to come, do we not? We want the power of him to come to break our hard-nosed theology that we think we've got it figured out that we're God's gift to humanity, that we've got the last gift that there is, and with the Word of God that has given me, man, it could straighten all this mess out. And There's something wrong with that. Where is it pure, and where is it loving, and where is it submissive? Instead, it smacks of self-serving and self-exaltation. It should be full of mercy. I see somebody that is absolutely broken, and they're breaking themselves by their actions. They've got all kinds of sinful things going on in their lives. My heart is supposed to be one of, oh, brother, sister, let me help you. (coughs) (coughs) Know the Lord, if they don't know the Lord, and I'm supposed to be encouraging them to come to the Lord. If they say they know the Lord, I have to say, well, look, you, you, you must not because it says those who do things don't belong to Him, so would you please come and make a, a resolute decision that you want to belong to Him. If we're going to extend mercy, then a wisdom that we get is going to be good fruit. Someone, have you you ever eaten someone's bitter fruit that they hand you in church? Here's a word from God for you. You know, it's the sourest lemon you ever tasted in your life. And you think, wow, it's supposed to be good fruit. Good fruit is plump and juicy and sweet and filled with the presence of Jesus Christ and filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and will draw people in, not make them pucker up. Instead, it will bring holiness and righteousness. Good fruit is gentle and kind and loving and given in the right spirit. It's impartial. It's not about me. Good fruit is about God and about you and God and about how God can help you. Good fruit, being impartial and sincere. Now, we can't become like this without the Spirit. So, let's go back to the beginning, in Matthew chapter 8, I think it is. No, Matthew chapter 4. I thought I marked that. You can find it. I'll quote it to you. Leper. Needs to be healed. And he cries out to the Lord. If you speak, Lord, I'll be healed. Will you speak, Lord? Because if you do, I'll be healed. I don't think we realize until our nose is falling off our face. That's what a leopard... Their toes fall off, their fingers rot off, their nose rots off. Leprosy. It was big time bad news. First of all, we have to recognize our state. That's our true state. That's our spiritual state. And if the Lord, if we can call out to Him, and Lord, if You you will, I can be made whole. If You will. But there was a crying out from that dear soul of crying out, if if You speak, O Lord, if You speak, if if You just, if You say it. And then almost this question behind it, if you're, if you're willing to say it. And Jesus turns to that person and he says, I'm willing. And the man was healed. 
the pretense of the healing came on the basis of the individual absolutely saying that Jesus was the only answer for his healing, number one. Number two, it came on the basis of his recognition of his own state of his soul. And number three, that Jimmy, Jesus alone had the only remedy. If the Spirit of Christ dwells within you, why aren't we turning to the Spirit of Christ that's within us and saying, oh, Jesus, I'm dying. I'm full of rot. I do these wrong things. Oh, Jesus, help me. Help me. If you're willing, I can change. If you're willing to touch me. Now, here's the big question. What things in your life are you not doing that Jesus wouldn't be willing? Do you see the correlation? How do we get ourselves in a position that Jesus is willing? He's waiting to bring healing. He's waiting. I had a whole line of passages I was going to give you. It was our escape hatch that I evidently marked the wrong spot. And Jesus is walking to village to village. And he goes to Peter's house. And he touches Peter's wife. And she gets up and fixes meals. She's healing. And other people are brought in with all manner of demonic forces. And he's casting them out. And other people are brought in. And he's healing them left and right. But they were coming to him. They were crying out to him, not just for deliverance, but I want God, I want God. If we will begin to cry out to him with the whole heart and recognize the lack that we have, then he has a remedy for the person who's really underneath, for the resistor. You look at the fruit of your life and how much time you spend in the presence of God. Look at the fruit that's there. Look at, see what you're missing. You know, if I said I had a car and I just had a tire in the garage, it would be easy for me to go in and calculate, wait a minute, I only see a tire. What else am I missing? Are you missing peace in your life? Are you missing, there's nothing more gleeful when the Lord comes in and touches me and says, you're washed completely clean, Curtis. There's nothing between you and I. I can feel it. I can almost dance on the clouds of being set free. The freedom it brings me fully into the kingdom of light. And, and I'm no longer burdened with whatever was burdening me. I'm no longer being intercepted. I'm no longer kept out of his presence. So I would ask you to be mindful. To seek after the things of the Spirit. Make sure they are things of the Spirit because things of the Spirit are going to manifest purity and gentleness and lovingness and kindness. All those actions will be present in those. No hostilities, no anger, no frustration, no I've got to control. That spirit of control can be recognized by, oh, this is so important. Oh, oh. <laughs> spirit of control still, but now it's gone religious on you. Instead, there was, oh, your kingdom, your kingdom come and your will be done and it's for you you put yourself in that little box it's not for anybody it's for you it's you that cries out and it's you that realizes and it's you that says I, I can be healed if, if you're willing Lord if you're willing and he says I'm willing if you're willing to crucify your flesh he says I'm willing if you're willing to cast down your thoughts and replace them with my thoughts I'm willing, if you're willing, to engage with me finally on my terms and put your gear in mine and let me spin it the way I want to. You do the things I say instead of what you feel like or what you want or what you desire. Do the things my way. He's willing. He's willing. We must get ourselves into that position of calling ourselves over the line into that place where we can be healed, into that place where we can have manifest healing on our hearts because many of you have heavy burdens. Many of you have clouds coming. Many of you, Jesus is willing to do everything that there is that will benefit His Father and His kingdom and fulfill His purposes. And if you're fulfilling His purposes, all the purposes of your life become His purposes and those purposes are full of life, full of joy, full of peace, full of action. Action, a man of action, a woman of action, a woman carrying out and doing the deeds of God that you can look behind you and you can see the wake of all the accomplishments and, and, and just, 
when you when you really feel bad about yourself, the Lord says, "Let me let me show you that I did this through you and that through you and that through you." Oh, oh, thank you, Lord. Now, if I turn to Him and say, "Hey, I did this for you and that for you," <laughs> wrong thing, wrong thing. So make it resolute in your heart that whatever ditch that you've been in, and what's worse, if you don't think you're in a ditch. <laughs> if you don't, I've got some water and we're going to go test you and see if you can walk on some water. If you can't walk on it, you're going to have to be in agreement with me that maybe there's a ditch around. And the ditch might be your super spirituality that's above everybody else's. Because as long as we got super spirituality that's above everybody else's, we kind of walk submissively in the presence of Jesus. And we kind of accurately hear. Do you want to accurately hear? Do you want to activate the embryo of Christ within you? Do you want to energize him with the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you want to let him finally have his way? And will you engage as his bride with him on terms of him being the husband? Him being the one that sets the direction. Because if you resist him, he's going to slam on the brakes and you're going to bang. And if you resist him again, he's going to spin it the opposite way and you're going to bang. And if you resist him again, he's going to spin it the opposite way, and you bang. I had a car one time, and the gears got jammed in it, down in the little gearbox thing, you know. <clears throat> had a real powerful engine. And I made a determination, since it was going to have to go to shop anyway, I'm going to see if the engine can power these gears back into their place where they can go. Jam it in the first gear, drop the clutch. No, 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 no. Put it in reverse. I won. Those gears conformed. I had to do that about 50 times, but the gears finally slid back in place. And you say, well, that was threatening to the gears. Well, it was a train coming. It was parked on the track. It was threatening to life. You can't be a resistor. Engage with God. Disengage with your own functionality, your own purposes, and stop believing what Satan has to say. He's speaking to some of you right now, condemning you, saying, oh, you're just so condemned. You just do it so wrong. Stop listening to him and listen to the Lord your God. He's calling you. And call upon him and say, I have a need. I, I have a need of healing. Are you willing? Are you willing? I've conspired against you. I've listened to the enemy. I've done everything wrong. Are you willing to heal me? I need you. Oh, God, will you do something inside me? I need you. When you get serious enough to cry out to him, he'll help you past what the enemy has to say. And he'll bring life into your soul. And he'll activate the Spirit and pursue the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and pursue Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul, and purposes. And make him your purpose in life. The end. Let's pray. Lord, I used to love shooting the rapids. I forgot how thrilling they are, but also how threatening they are and how the deliverance was of coming up on some sandy beach and finally crawling out in the cold waters of reality. I look back at some of the slippery slopes and I say thank you for your deliverance. I say thank you for your, your transferring work that you're doing within us your power being released and you're building us and changing our thought process so it is so wrong fill us with new desires for anyone who asks fill them with a new desire for anyone who's willing to cast down the old desires give them new desires build us up into something that you would be thrilled to come and stand in our midst. And bless us, O oh God, with your fellowship. In Jesus' great and powerful and precious name, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> no prayer meeting tonight. That doesn't relieve you from praying wherever you are. <laughs> you pray and ask God. Pray for someone else. Ask God for three people to pray for other than yourself. See, that's, if we're not praying about ourselves, we can be a little bit more powerful about that. Invoke 
the Spirit and ask Him, will you move upon that person? Now, there's many who need healing, many who need their finances restored, many who need relational functionality, many who are in hopeless situations. If you've ever been in a hopeless situation, there are some people who are in some hopeless situations. Our God is the only one that can change those things, but in the midst of it, He can change us. So be in prayer for one another. Don't believe the enemy. Cast down what he has to say. Resist him, he'll flee from you. He's not all-powerful. Resist him, he will flee from you. Say that. Resist him, he will flee from me. Say that again. Resist him, he will flee from me. Do you believe that? And go be a resistor to him instead of God. They'll go fellowship with each other, love on each other. If anybody needs prayer, be glad to lay hands on you and pray for you. Elton, would you join me, please?